sisters. Today's Bible study lesson will be on one body, many parts. We will come from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Thank you for just allowing me, me to see each and every one that's here today. Thank you for all, each and every one of us. Thank you for the love that we have between us. Thank you that you have loved us and shown us how to love each other. So we thank you and we love each and every one of us. We know that um, besides you, after you, we have to love our brothers and our sisters. So Father God, we come here loving our brothers and our sisters and just asking you to show us more love and we show each other more love. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible, can you someone turn to Romans chapter 12 and let's read verses 1 through 2, 1 through 3. Thank you. We're going to open up with a question. First question is, can being a good person qualify you for presenting your body as a living sacrifice? Can being a good person qualify you for presenting your body as a living sacrifice? I heard some, no, no. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you all. If God had not done what he did for us, there would be no compelling reason why we should now do what he says. However, God has done what he said he would do. Therefore, Paul is not asking for a favor when he says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. But rather, Paul is insisting on an obligation for those who already belong to God's family. The obligation can only be for the brethren, since the unregenerate person cannot give his God his body, his mind, or his will because he has not given God himself. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 11 through 14 says, no one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's word to explain spiritual truth. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual 
can understand what the spirit means. Those verses was 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11 through 14. Only the redeemed can present a living sacrifice to God because only the redeemed have spiritual life. An unbeliever cannot do this because an unbeliever is spiritually dead. The unbeliever does not understand the Christian. They live in two different worlds. Yet sometimes the unredeemed still try to present their bodies to God, but their efforts are considered filthy. Romans 8, verse 5 through 8, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. The fleshly mind is always at enmity with God. The flesh can never please God. No matter how many good works a person might do, the unredeemed person cannot make an acceptable offering to God. The unredeemed cannot present their bodies to God as a living sacrifices because they have not presented themselves to God to receive spiritual life. God is holy, and whatever works are not born from God's own spirit cannot satisfy his holiness. But to those who have presented themselves to God, Romans chapter 8, verse 9 through 14 tells us, but you are not controlled by the sinful, your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit. If you have the spirit of God living in you, and remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Amen. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by, it di by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put, the de put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. That was Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 14. When we think of the mercies of God, we should understand that the greater our understanding of what God has done for us, the greater our commitment should be. The only thing that saves a human race lost in sin is the mercy of God. Grace is often defined as undeserved mercy, and the gospel could be labeled the results of God's mercy to sinners. Mercy is that compassion-based response of God to the plight of humans that causes him to forego the punishment for sin that we so deserve and give us the forgiveness that we do not deserve. The mercies of God are reflected in his power of salvation and in his great kindness to those he saves. His mercies in Christ brings us the forgiveness of our sins and freedom from them. Because of his mercies, we have received reconciliation with him, justification before him, confirmation to his son, glorification in his very likeness, eternal life in his very presence, and the resurrection of our bodies to serve him in his everlasting kingdom. We have received the mercies of divine sonship and of the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us in Christ we also have received the mercies of faith, faith, peace, and hope. Our total commitment to God is based on the totality of his mercy to us. Question, 
can a Christian serve two masters? <laughs> no, unanimous, no. <laughs> Romans 6, verse 12 through 16. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirement of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Uh, no, uh, no, of course not. Don't you realize that you became the slave, you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. That was Romans 6, verses 12 through 16. For the Christian, presenting your body to serve the old master is completely illogical. They just don't go together. If you are a Christian, you don't serve the old, your old master. And at one time, you did have an old master. Regardless of what you may think or what the world may think, all of us have had an old master. However, presenting your body to serve the interest, interest of our new master is completely logical in keeping with our new nature and our new purpose. So we read in those verses, and you all answered um, about because we received God's grace, could we continue to just keep on sinning. And we all pretty much said, no, no, it was unanimous. So can, let's expound on that a little bit. Can I have someone expound on why we can't, uh, why we shouldn't, because we have grace, why we shouldn't keep on sinning? Since we, have re we are receiving God's grace, why shouldn't we continue to keep on sinning? That's the question. Yes, sir. We know there was a sacrifice. There was one sacrifice that completely satisfied God. And there, are, there is no other sacrifice. There is only that one sacrifice that completely satisfied God, um, God. So we don't have to go through that judgment. And I think we had a lesson uh, maybe a week or two ago about God's judgment. And if you heard that lesson, or if, even if you read the Bible, you don't want to go through God's judgment. The anybody else? So as a Christian, we should try, as a Christian, we should follow our new master. And we know how our new, Jesus came, when Jesus came, he completely obeyed God's will. He didn't go off on his own tangent and do what he wanted to do. So as a Christian, what, should we be the same way? Because Christian means Christ-like, right? So we should be that same way, right? So if Jesus did it, and we're not going to be perfect like Jesus, but that doesn't mean we don't strive to continue to be perfect like perfect like him. You know, we may get knocked down, we may trip. But 
we get back up because we know God's grace and mercy is saving us. And we have a we have witnesses that are watching us and they want the world wants to see us that knock down. They like, oh he knocked down. I knew he couldn't do it. You know, sometimes when you we see people come into the church and we say, you know, some some people may say things, not us, but some people may look what the cat dragged in you know, or whatever the saying is. You know, I can't believe they came in the church. But we shouldn't be that way, you know, because we got dragged in, too. <laughs> All of us got dragged in. right now. Sometimes our blessings are for our children, for our grandchildren, for those. I know we all have heard of, of, I had a praying mother. I had a praying grandmother. And even though the child may not have came to Christ during that parents or grandparents time, because that child has that remembrance to go back. You know, my grandmother prayed for me. I know what she was doing. I know what I was doing was wrong. My grandmother prayed for me. And they give themselves so they are now able to testify as a living witness, to give their self, give their bodies as a living body, as a living sacrifice. Yes, sir. Brother teacher, that's why it's so important that we do not prejudge that individual that's coming in. Because God only knows what word is going to be given. Mm -hmm. And that word might just be for that individual mm -hmm. to save that one lost soul. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, you. and I'm going off <laughs> script, so we all could join one together. But so this question, and I know it's going to be a unanimous answer, is there one sin better than the other or worse than the other? As far as in God's view, sin is sin. So the person that comes in that may be whatever type sin, we all have sin, right? That's what the Bible tells us. All of us have sin. And if we say not, what are we? Liar, <laughs> right? So we shouldn't be judging others. You're right. And what's the scripture? Um, uh, it's like judge. Oh, I can't remember the scripture. Judge not. Judge not. Right. And who wants to be judged? Who wants Jesus to judge them? <laughs> you know, when you, Jesus has already told us what we should do. And he's already told us in the scripture. Some will come and say, didn't I do this? We did not do this. Didn't I do that? And what is he going to say? Depart from me. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Oh, you're just stretching. All right. <laughs> so. And be thankful that we still have the time that the tares on wheat are growing, that they can, some of the wheat can become wheat. Some of the tares can become wheat. Because God could have cut us off at any time. And we all were not sheep. <laughs> all, so all of us have been goats at some time. All of us have been tares at some time. So now we have the opportunity, we have had the opportunity to become what God wants us to be. Yes, sir. Who 
wants to know, who wants to be there? You say, oh, I gave my tithe. I taught the lesson. I was in the pulpit preaching. I was the best deacon. I was the best singer. And G all this you have done. And, you know, Jesus tells you, depart from me. Because <laughs> the only thing. Unless you say all sin in God's eye, yeah. all sin is sin. Yeah. The man looks at it as, yeah, that's just a small thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> man doesn't have a heaven or a hell to put you in, too. <laughs> Any others? Thank you. Presenting your body as a living sacrifice is the key to victory and joy. Most people try to get all they can from God, but the key to satisfaction and happiness is to give yourself and all that you are and all that you have to the Lord. Mm -hmm. We must offer our bodies as to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Under the old covenant, a sacrificial animal was to be without spot or blemish. Sacrifices of dead animals are no longer acceptable to God because the Lamb of God has been sacrificed. Because Jesus Christ has already made the only sacrifice that the new covenant requires, all that remains for the Christian today is the presentation of themselves as the living sacrifice. We must be willing to sacrifice. Well, this is the question then. What must we be willing to sacrifice? Let's give some examples. What must we, as we walk through this daily life, be willing to sacrifice? Our pride. Our pride. A life, <laughs> time, I will. What if I, my hopes are, you know, I'm five years I'm going to do this, I'm going to retire, I'm going to have a million dollar retirement income, I'm going to just chill. Do I have to be willing to sacrifice that for the God? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. May I have a reader, and we're going to read about a sacrifice. Turn to Genesis chapter 22 and read verses 1 through 13. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 13. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 13.
Thank you. Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19 tells us also, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. That was Hebrews 11 through 11, chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. These verses make clear that Abraham was willing to slay Isaac because he was certain that God could raise him from the dead if necessary to keep his promise. What can keep God from keeping his promise? <laughs> Nothing. If God promised it, you are sure it's going to happen. Abraham was willing to commit absolutely everything to God and to trust him, no matter how great the demand or sac devastating the sacrifice, because God is faithful. The believer is to be holy in that we have renounced sin and set and are set apart for God. Set apart to God. We are to be pleasing sacrifices, not because we deserve to be accepted, but because the offerings are true to God's specification. The call to total commitment applies equally to all. Correct? To the teacher? to the preacher, to the musician, to the usher, to the deacon, to the trustee, to the missionaries, to the youth, to the seniors. This call to total commitment applies to everyone. There is no he's underage or he's overage. It applies to everyone, including the entire church. We must put away this false thinking that makes a distinction between the clergy and the lay person. The idea is that ministers and missionaries should have 100% commitment, but the lay person could be co permitted to commit 75%, 30%, or even 1%. The truth is all believers are called to be totally 100% committed to Christ. Halfway commitment is irrational. To decide to give parts of your life to God and keep other parts of yourself is like saying, everything is yours, Lord, but this relationship, this deal, this pleasure is mine. If you are worshiping apart from total commitment to God, it is false worship. We are deceiving ourselves if we are doing Christian things but are not totally committed to Jesus Christ. Next question, why should we not be like the world? How does, why, all right, there's going to be several questions. Why should we not be like the world? Yeah, that's it. Yes. 
mix. So that brings up what we all responded. That brings up the next question. How does the world try to press you into its mold? How does the world try to influence you into its way of thinking? us to be like them. said the, uh, heaven and earth will pass away but we all have a we all have that source it's not like only this person can re get the source of our strength only this person only the pastor only the deacon we all can get that source of strength you know when I um, go off and when I used to go off and do communion and I would see the sick and shut in and I was like they are some strong people they they're never uh, disparaging God, they're just accepting what He does, and they're still witnessing for them, for Him. And so, in their witnessing, they show me that you can still be strong. They have that same source. You know, you don't have to be well. I can ride up to Atlanta. I can ride over here. I can go here. The source is wherever you are. It's all you have to do, you used to say, get in your closet. <laughs> you can pray wherever you want, and God will strengthen you. Oh, I saying things also. When you see things are sinful and wrong and you just don't say anything, that's letting someone else know, well, it's okay. If I see a group of people and they're cursing or whatever and I'm just sitting there, 
<laughs> what am I telling the world? thing I like about God is if you don't know, he says ask for wisdom. That's He'll send right. your spirit. Right. He'll send his spirit to you and he, I mean when we were in the world, I'll use myself when I was in the world and I was planning to do wrong, it wasn't like um, God didn't tell me you know what you're about to do. You know, I ain't told anybody I was going to do wrong, but you know what you're about to do is wrong. He sent his spirit to tell me what I was about to do was wrong. So I have no excuse when I, if I didn't repent, I have no excuse when I come to God and say, well, I didn't know I was wrong. I didn't know what I was going to do was wrong. Oh, no. He sent his spirit to tell me what I was about to do, what I was planning to do. I may have been planning the next five minutes, the next day or two, the next week or two, next month. But what I was about to do, God told me, you're, you're wrong. I'm glad he lets us uh, repent of our sins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Verse 2 of Romans 12 <laughs> says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you 
into a new person by changing the way you think. That's 12.2.8. Believers are no longer to conform themselves to the present age. Being conformed refers to the act of a person assuming an outward behavior that does not come from within him. It does not express the heart of the person. Conforming to the world is hypocrisy. The word, the word hypocrisy means to play the part. If we are committed to Christ, then we need to behave as obedient children. We must not allow ourselves to be conformed to this world. We must stop masquerading as a worldly person for whatever the reason is. We must stop allowing ourselves to be fashioned after the present age in which we live. God requires a total change of person. Our outward life should reflect an inward inner change. Conformity is a lack of obedience that adopts the attitude, mindset, and purpose of the, of the culture of which we are a part. Conformity belongs to the time of ignorance when we did not know Christ and so live like the world. As believers, we are to conform to the example of Christ. Question. Since there is temptation and peer pressure all around us, what is the solution so that we won't be conformed to the world? Not the word of God in your heart. Satan knows the word, and Satan will give you words, but as you mentioned about when Jesus was in the temptation, Satan may leave out a word, twist it a little way, or didn't do this word, says they would do this, and Jesus knows the true purpose of the word and the true meaning of the word, so he could give it back. And as Pastor said, we also should study so that we know how to give back the word. Not, because some people will use the word, and they will leave out this. You know, when I'm um, you have people that when we work with, and I think um, some of the Jehovah Witnesses would say, you know, we can all be a God. No, you know, and they'll, they will point to a scripture and say, you know, you can all do this and you can do this and you can do this. But you have to know the word so that you don't get um, distracted, confused, or whatever, and become like them. You know, when we know God's word, we, as been already said, we can stand on God's word and not have to, we don't even have to debate with them. <laughs> you know, they're not even worth it. We don't even have to debate with them. We know God's word. Yes, brother, then yes, sister, and yes, sister. <laughs> As long as we have God and the world has a thousand, we still win. We still win. <laughs> And it helps us even during the church ser sermons. You know, when you go to Sunday school and you go to Bible study, now when the pastor is preaching, you can understand what they're talking about. You can relate. 
But if you don't have that foundation, and the pastor is preaching, and you know, first of all, he's like, "What's the King James? I don't know these words and stuff." You know, what are all these believers that I was? There's no other, it's not another, any other route. See, the other deep. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. Is that what it is? Oh. Can I have a reader read, uh, reminding almost now, can I have a reader read Romans 12, verses 4 through 8? Romans 12, verses 4 through 8. A basketball team may have 12 to 13 members on the roster, but only five of them are going to play at a time. If all five decided to be the center, then the team would have no unity and no effectiveness. True unity arises when each team member is willing to play the specific position assigned to him. In thinking of the body of Christ, are there any parts that are greater or more important than others? No, no, all right. In the spiritual organism that is Christ's church, every part is critical to its proper functioning. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 26, for as the body is one and have many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God has set the members, every one of them in the body as it pleased him. And if they were all one member, where, where were the body? But now are there they many members yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the head, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. 
and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor, honor to the part which lacks, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members shall have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. That was 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 26. How many of you have walked in the dark, out of the bed, middle of the night, and your toe hit, hit something? You hit something with your toe. Is it only your toe that hurts? <laughs> Does only your toe react? Does your mouth say things? <laughs> your, your, your mouth say things? Do you bend over? Do you ache? Do you jump? Do you do all kind of other actions? You know, you may, you may have been walking like, you know, I'm asleep. I'm going to go back to sleep. Pow! Oh, now you're awoke again. <laughs> and you're sitting in the bed, and if your wife or your spouse is in the bed, and ow, 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 and then they take care of you. You know, they have to rub you and all that down and everything. All that because of one toe. How often do we take care of our toes? What are some of the benefits that we take care of our feet? You know, you go to the pedicure and the manicures and everything, and you have people rubbing your feet, massaging, scraping off this, scraping off that, but you're doing that to help your feet because your feet are important. You, um, but you know, no one, well, I wasn't say no one goes around and say, let me look at my eyes, make sure my eyes look good, make sure my ears and all that. But those are what we consider most of the time the most honorable parts, but let your foot get to hurt, you know, let your toe get to hurt, and, and you would know what the most honorable, you would know what honorable parts mean. God has arranged the human body, so every part is important to every other part. In the same way, the body of Christ is composed of one body that depends on all the members, all the members functioning together to work. Yet at the same time, each member performs a different task. If any of those of the parts of the body try to function other than the way it was intended, the body is crippled. All of us are meant to form one body, the church, and to work together in unity to function as the church. Individual believers are to see themselves connected to and belonging to one another. Spiritual pride is the en enemy of true unity in Christ. The attitudes that says, I am a better Christian because I know my Bible better than you, or because I have been in church longer than you, is the world's attitude. The Christian attitude says, I need you and you need me because we belong to one another in Christ. Romans 6, verse 4 through 5 says, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. And I am out of time, so I'm going to give any closing comments. From the yes. We have to remember too that God is a loving Savior first. And that's just his body and his blood. Amen. Yes, sir.
Well, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent, one from another. We wish everyone safe. We pray for everyone safe travels back home. We pray that we just continue to be more and more like God. And as the lesson taught, I believe, last week about having that heart that just continues to just search for God, continue to want to please God. We want to have a heart not like David, but have a heart like Jesus Christ. We want to be seeking Jesus always. We want to make sure, is God offended by what we do, or is God pleased by what we do? We want to go share out to the world. We don't want to just keep it all to ourselves. We want to be able to go shout to the world outside of these walls and just let them know God is alive. He is going to come back and judge. And there is a way right now. You only have this way right now to escape that judgment. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and who is our Savior's name. Amen. Ha, ha, ha.